Good evening and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Shannon Miller and I'm one of the two Ath Fellows and please excuse my voice, I'm recovering from a cold. <laughs> um, presidential elections, like the one we have coming up in 2016, force certain discussions back to the forefront every four years. One such topic we'll be sure to hear much about as we approach 2016 is federalism and separation of powers. What should the relationship between the states and the federal government look like? And what powers should the president have in relation to the other branches and the states? Michael S. Griva, who teaches constitutional law at George Mason University School of Law, has a lot to offer on these questions. Griva argues that the way we understand federalism today is based on the cooperative model of the New Deal, where a combination of private and public affluence, homogenous states, and a functioning Congress, um, a rarity these days, succeeded in expanding government services. However, watching the news for 15 minutes uh, should demonstrate that these conditions no longer hold. And, Grieva believes, they won't return anytime soon. He argues that this predicament heralds the rise of an essentially extra-legal executive federalism, and avoiding that fate would require a major overhaul of our most basic federalism arrangements. Professor Grieva was previously a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and was the founder and co-director of the Center for Individual Rights, a public interest law firm specializing in constitutional litigation. Michael Grieva's Athenaeum talk is sponsored by CMC's Rose Institute of State and Local Government. As always, I must remind you that audio and visual recording are strictly prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Michael Grieva to the Ath. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, thank you. I thank the uh, Bose Institute for the um, kind invitation and uh, all of you for being here. Uh, that was a terrific summary of my talk. Um, and maybe I should just spend, you know, 35 minutes telling stupid lawyer jokes. Um, <laughs> it, it, the, it's actually a fairly grim uh, subject uh, I, I have tonight. Um, I, I have sort of teed up for tonight. Um, it's about federalism, uh, but it's about sort of federalism in the way um, Moby Dick is about a whaling voyage. Um, what I really want to do is sort of think a little more uh, broadly about the state of our public affairs and ideally to think somewhat seriously about the Constitution. And so here's how, and let me start you with uh, something of a paradox. Uh, the Constitution embodies general principles of federalism and embodies general principles of lawful government. It embodies some other principles, but this is what I want to focus on. Um, and we like to think that these principles, federalism, the rule of law, government under laws, are perfectly coherent and consistent. Right? Federalism comes from the Constitution or it comes from uh, the Congress under duly enacted um, statutes, but either way, it's lawful government. Um, my somewhat heterodox and dispiriting um, hypothesis here uh, is that under current conditions, federalism and government under law have become incompatible. You can have one or the other, but you can't have both. Uh, so put somewhat differently, um, extra legal improvisation on the part of the federal government is the only way for our political system to sustain a federalism that is collapsing and uh, crumbling at all ends. Uh, I realize that that sounds awfully abstract, but uh, you'll sort of recognize the theme, I think, if you think about sort of the stories that you read in the newspapers or on the blogs or whatever else you read, um, right? The coverage of our domestic uh, policy debates. So the, the lawful government theme is um, everywhere. Um, the present administration has been widely criticized for pushing awfully hard on the outer limits of uh, lawful government. Um, and many of its biggest initiatives on climate change and the Affordable Care Act and immigration and a lot of other things uh, have ended up in the federal courts with mixed results. I want to emphasize that for the purposes of my talk tonight, it doesn't really matter whether you think what you think of the legal merits of this or that dispute or who you think is right and whose side you're on. Um, 
Um, in fact, I, one of my points will be that you would get the same uh, result, um, government operating at the outer limits of the Constitution under a Republican administration. Um, and then note that the so federalism theme um, is equally um, prevalent, right? So at times the administration has been criticized uh, for ignoring federalism and trampling on, upon states. So <clears throat> it's currently trying to bamboozle or drum um, states into a very, very ambitious uh, clean power um, uh, program under a statute, the Clean Air Act, which is not remotely designed for uh, the endeavor and provides no authority for it. Uh, but for the most part, the administration's legally dubious or doubted maneuvers have actually been undertaken on behalf of states and in favor of states. So the administration is attempting to waive ironclad legal commands to allow states to legalize marijuana. It has waived numerous um, requirements in the Affordable Care Act to permit states to establish health care exchanges. It has waived virtually all requirements of the No Child Left Behind Act. Uh, most strikingly, maybe it's uh, offering states to pay a 100% reimbursement uh, for covering ad ad additional beneficiaries under the Medicaid statute on the sole condition that the states please take the money. Um, right? And so um, all of these initiatives were designed or are designed to accommodate the, uh, to try and accommodate the state's interests and demands. And to that end, all of them waive or suspend duly enacted statutes and substitute a patchwork of executive state agreements for those statutes. So that's my principal theme. Uh, our federalism is related to the pressures that now operate on the rule of law. Federalism is a principal source of that pressure, and more federalism of the sort we have would mean yet more extra legal and extra constitutional government, and that will be true under the president of either party. That thought is so cool, and it is so deep that I wish it were my own, um, but it isn't. It's actually Alexander Hamilton's. Um, so the entire talk tonight is an extended riff on Federalist 15 and 16. Um, it's not about anything new, right? It's just about all the things we have forgotten. <clears throat> As you heard in that excellent summary at the beginning, um, our federalism is by and large the federalism settlement of the New Deal. The conventional moniker for that federalism is cooperative federalism which uh, the New Dealers coined, uh, the term, a, a term which they coined to distinguish their federalism from what went before, which they called dual federalism. So dual federalism um, operated on principles of separation and specialization, right? So the federal government is one of uh, limited and enumerated powers, so the feds do their stuff and the states do theirs, and there's your separation and specialization. Um, cooperative federalism operates on the opposite principles, concurrent state and federal powers over the full range of domestic uh, affairs. And because you have both levels of government operating over the same stuff, they have to bargain to sort out their mutual relations. So from labor law to land use, from banking to bathrooms, everything is subject to regulation by several layers of government. Likewise, Federal statutes are implemented primarily by state and governments. Almost all of them are, often under federal grant programs. Um, the judicial corollary of this is something called process federalism, which means that federalism must be protected um, through the political process as opposed to judicial interpretation of formal constitutional norms. Um, the law that governs this universe, these relations between um, uh, federal and state governments is kind of complicated. We teach it, I teach it, uh, in a course called Federal Courts, which is the nastiest thing you'll encounter in law school. Um, so let me bore you with it for the next 20 minutes. No, let me not do that. 
Um, let me instead sort of take you back to the sort of constitutional um, baseline. Um, my point in sort of droning on about the constitutional baseline is not to treat you to some original intent tirade, but to sort of talk about and, and sort of illuminate um, the Constitution's political economy. Uh, as you know, the, f the founders did not use the word federalism in our uh, modern sense. Madison called the, James Madison called the system a compound republic. It's a mix of national and federal elements. <clears throat> the fastidious econ uh, the taxonomy appears in Federalist 39. Um, and insofar as is relevant for tonight, uh, Madison explains there that the general government's powers are federal in extent and national in operation. What he means by federal in extent is something very familiar. It's a government of limited and enumerated powers. And the states get to do the rest. Um, by national in operation, he meant several things. First, um, federal law is supreme over state law, right? So it trumps any uh, contravening state law. And second, he meant that federal law would operate directly on individual citizens, not on states and without the assistance of the states. <clears throat> this national operation of federal law is not some sort of curlicue on the Constitution. How cute is that? It's, it's Archimedean uh, point. Flip back a few essays and now go to um, Federalist 15 and 16. Uh, that's where Hamilton <coughs> deals with what he calls and actually rails against the great and radical vice of the Articles of Confederation. What is that vice? Answer, the principle of legislation for states or governments in their corporate or collective capacities and as contradistinguished from the individuals of whom they consist. That's the great and radical vice of the Articles it operates on states as states. What he has in mind principally is the requisition system. Why is that a vice? Um, well, unlike individual citizens, uh, Hamilton thought and wrote, um, subordinate governments can be ruled only by military force, never by law. And since the national government would neither be willing nor able to use force on states, the result would be sort of an imbecilic, feckless government. Law, he wrote, can only operate on individuals, the only proper objects of government. <clears throat> and so the federal government must carry its agency to the persons of the citizens. It must stand in need of no intermediate legislations, but must itself be empowered to employ the arm of the ordinary magistracy, by which he means federal courts, um, to execute its own resolutions. Right? Supreme federal law, national, direct in operation. Fast forward 150 years um, and look at the New Deal's cooperative federalism in that light. It looks like the New Dealers sort of inv inverted the entire uh, logic of the compound republic. <clears throat> As you all know, the general government's powers became national, meaning effectively unlimited in scope, in extent. But they became federal in operation. That's what cooperative federalism means. Federal laws operating on and implemented by states. Right, so it looks like the New Dealers um, enshrined very deliberately, very purposefully, um, Hamilton's vice, a government over governments. Now, why would they do that? Who would do such a thing? Um, well, there were lots of uh, practical reasons. I mean, put yourself into the shoes of Franklin Roosevelt and his assistants uh, or his aides, right? So they try to ramp up an entire big national government in a real hurry. <clears throat> and you cannot create out of nothing a federal bureaucracy to administer, let's say, unemployment insurance. So naturally, you go with what's already there, state bureaucracies. Um, 
<coughs> but there were, excuse me, but there were also two quasi-constitutional calculations at work, and here they are. Um, one, once the federal governments, the national governments' powers become national in extent, unlimited, leaving them national in operation would mean that the states might as well go out of business, right? Federal law covers the waterfront and it's directly enforced. What's there left to do for states? Nothing. Um, Right, so securing the state's operations, uh, state's assistance in the operation of federal law and in the implementation of federal law, that was a way of giving states something useful to do and as the founders, uh, as, as the New Dealers called it, of preserving the federal balance. And the second sort of quasi-constitutional calculation was that Look, the Constitution had in fact solved Hamilton's force or law problems uh, in two ways. One is the supremacy clause, right? So if the feds legislate for states and the states don't cooperate, well, the feds can always respond by legislating directly or by administering the program directly. Those arrangements are called conditional preemption statutes. <clears throat> and the other sort of quasi-constitutional uh, consideration that makes you think, uh, oh, Hamilton, that's just so outdated, the Constitution has solved that, is the Constitution gave Congress access uh, to an independent source of funds. It has federal tax powers, right? There's money. We can induce states to cooperate with money, right? So put, put this a little differently, Congress can legislate for states not individuals, without threatening brute force and military intervention, because in a crunch it can always preempt states and legislate for individuals, courtesy of the Supremacy Clause. Or Congress can bargain around the constitutional baseline, because the taxing powers conferred by the Constitution, unlike the Articles, provided with an independent source of revenue, which the government can then use to incentivize the states to cooperate. And there you have it, cooperative federalism. That system worked for many decades. Um, by worked, I don't mean the policy outcomes. Um, most scholars who study these things, um, and these are not libertarian crazies, okay? Um, Peter Schuck at Yale, um, Others argue that the system hasn't worked very well at all. <clears throat> so here's, an, here's the kinds of examples they have in mind. Um, education became a cooperative program in 1965. Um, since then, the per student cost of education has tripled in real dollars and measured student achievements have, side, have, have flatlined. You can generalize that lesson. Cooperative federalism consistently produces systemic policy failure, fiscal irresponsibility, public disaffection. In short, it has given us exactly the feckless and imbecilic government that Hamilton predicted. Um, but what I mean by it worked is the system worked in a political and institutional sense. Its central objective was the expansion of government of, at all levels. And that project has succeeded beyond uh, its architect's wildest expectations. Um, crucially, the growth of, uh, growth of government uh, has principally been the growth of state and local government, uh, not the federal government. Um, and, right, so, so in subsequent federalism innovations, like the big innovations of the great society, um, built on and extended the New Deal settlement. And to this day, New Deal federalism, cooperative federalism, has proven astoundingly resilient to very severe outside shocks like the Reagan Revolution, the so-called Reagan Revolution, and then the fiscal crisis in 2008 and 2009, right? So it's a bit like, <clears throat> like the European Union, right? The, in the EU, there is no single problem to which ever closer union is not the answer. Um, and by the same token, there's never been a problem in the United States 
um, to which more cooperative federal federalism is not the answer. So if the Elementary <clears throat> Education Act, originally enacted in 65, isn't working, let's have no child left behind. If that fails, let's have a race to the top. If that bombs, let's have Common Core. That won't work either. Um, but that's just the point I'm trying to make. I mean, the results don't matter. The system will remain stable. <clears throat> my point, um, and this is really my central point, I suppose, is this. Um, this system is now, cooperative federalism, is now crumbling at all ends. That's why we're trying to patch it up with extra legal means. I'll give you a few more illustrations in a moment. Why should that be so? Um, well, the answer, and this was also in the excellent summary, is uh, that I think um, cooperative federalism presupposes three conditions. Economic affluence, um, willing states, and a functioning Congress. And these conditions, I'll go through them in a sec, <clears throat> have all ceased to exist, and they're not going to return anytime soon. So start out at the top, the end of affluence. Uh, what I mean by affluence is not sort of an absolute level of wealth. It's more like a sense, a general sense of growing prosperity and, you know, hey, we can afford this. <clears throat> uh, so, for example, I mean, we cheerfully tolerate uh, the fact that corporations that operate in national commerce are governed by 51 different sovereigns. Um, Right? And you do that only, a country will do that only if it thinks it can't afford to waste a great deal of money and productive energy. <clears throat> but this connection between affluence and uh, cooperative arrangements is particularly tight in the fiscal domain, that is to say, uh, conditional spending programs such as Medicaid. Um, the point of these programs, federal programs, is to increase the demand for government uh, by lowering the perceived tax price of the programs, both at the federal and state level. Um, right? So these programs are built to demand ever-increasing cash infusions, which is how they have developed over time. And when that can no longer be done or taken for granted, the federal-state bargain just falls apart. And so it has. Remember, the Affordable Care Act offered states a 100% reimbursement for expanding Medicaid. Two dozen states litigated against that largesse, and to this day there are 20 states that refuse to take the money. <clears throat> There's undoubtedly a sort of a partisan and ideological element to this, right? The states just hate, I mean, those states, red states, they don't like Obamacare. Um, <clears throat> but that could be overcome, I mean, by offering them yet more money. Um, Right, what is new here, I think, is that this proposed bargain, here's 100% money, is too good to be true. States no longer trust the federal government's pre-commitment uh, for the excellent reason that Medicaid's expansion at the federal level is purely debt financed. Moreover, Medicaid is ruinous to state governments with or without the ACA expansion. It's now the single, level, uh, single, uh, single biggest state-run program spending is much higher now than even for education, and it's projected to grow at a rapid clip about doubling in less than a decade. That cannot happen. That cannot continue. <clears throat> right, and you can see the strains already. Um, right, the point of federal transfers, I've tried to explain, is to spur local tax effort Right? No state would spend 30% of its budget if, you know, on Medicaid if they had to raise their own funds for that. But citizens may be willing to tax themselves in the interest of attracting more federal funds. And that is no longer working. Uh, for well over a decade, decade now, state own source revenues have stalled out at 15% of GDP. They're no longer growing. What happens when the own source cost of these federal programs keep rising, because budget cuts would mean a loss of federal transfers? Well, states have solved the problem, and the way they've solved it is they've racked up debt in off-budget places, like pensions and other post-retirement benefits. 
Those debts now exceed $5 trillion. Those debts will not be paid because they cannot be paid. And that, program, that problem can't be solved through yet more federal transfers. So the game is up. <coughs> Second point, um, unwilling, willing or unwilling states. Cooperative federalism, as the name indicates, uh, presupposes willing states, not just a few, but well nigh all of them, because otherwise the federal programs would not go through. Um, and that's true even if the federal statutes provide for a federal fallback option, like for example the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act, or for that matter the Affordable Care Act. Um, right? No federal agency is built to administer its own program. They really need the states. Um, that's why federal state bargains are structured to pro produce uniform cooperation among states through some combination of carrots and sticks, coupled with a prom premise or promise of state flexibility. That is to say, they'll have the statutory authority to shirk. Um, and those arrangements cannot be made to work under conditions of very severe state heterogeneity if instead they if indeed they come about in the first place. So you'll notice, I mean, there were no institutionalized cooperative federalism programs that were stable prior to the New Deal. And the reason was you could not drum the recalcitrant states in the South into a federally sponsored bargain. They would just say no. You can overcome those dynamics under conditions of crisis and um, unusually high partisan consensus um, at the federal level as we did have under the New Deal and the Great Society. Um, but we don't have that consensus now, right? So in fact, the ideological divisions among the states have become sufficiently severe to make states defect from existing arrangements <clears throat> and to resist any effort to extend those arrangements. The Affordable Care Act, where the states just say no. Um, it's the most obvious example, but there are others. Climate change is another example. Um, and what that means is the federal programs will just disintegrate and take on this piecemeal um, uh, character. So the horizontal division among states that you observe in all these red state, blue state you know, maps, that's inconsistent with cooperative federalism. It can't be done. Finally, the Congress. Um, cooperative federalism says that federalism comes from Congress and is protected in and through Congress. Now, um, nothing comes from Congress these days. Um, we're about to regulate the internet under a statute that predates the fax machine by five decades. I am assuming against all evidence that you know what a fax machine is. Um, right? And when Congress when Congress does act, it orders federalism basically by saying to some agency, you do it, you order it. Either way, national federalism is executive federalism. In a way, that's an extension of the New Deal, right? I think this notion of, oh, Congress will provide for federal uh, relations was always, <coughs> excuse me, um, um, a charming delusion. Um, Right? You always needed a big administrative ma machinery to administer these systems and the bargains and to cut deals. Um, but the executive aggrandizement required under conditions of congressional deadlock and severe dissension among states um, is of a different order, right? So you now have agencies fabricating entire programs, wholly from, I mean, from whole cloth in derogation of their organic statutes, you have agencies come and deal vast resources uh, and revenue streams, raise and distribute unappropriated funds, and endeavor to entice, cajole, bludgeon states into some form of co cooperation, whether the states want it or not. Right, so go read the papers. I mean, I mentioned some of these things at the outset. Um, right, executive enforcement discretion is now said to encompass the authority to waive entire statutory programs for selected states. <laughs> the administration has claimed such waiver authority in derogation of the statutes 
in a wide range of areas, right? Drug policy, immigration, education, clean air, Act, and of course, Medicaid and the ACA. Even as we speak, Secretary Burwell is attempting to incite Thai states into Medicaid by waiving every statutory requirement under Medicaid except take the money one state at a time. The ACA's waiver provision for these health care exchanges, health, health benefit exchanges, uh, the waiver provisions kick in in 2017. Um, you'll see the same pattern, especially under a Republican president. You may agree or disagree with these programs. You may think they're a good idea or a bad idea. Um, but my point is, there's no law here. Congress has nothing to do with this except writing checks. That's what executive federalism means. <clears throat> right? So here's another way of putting this point. Uh, we are living with Hamilton's curse. You can try to run a government over governments, but it will be imbecilic. And it won't be a government of law. So now what? Um, well, I think, I hope, I think I know, we won't resort to Alexander Hamilton's alternative, military force. Um, but the alternative here is not much more appealing. Um, we won't govern by law either. Um, to check some of these tendencies towards executive government, executive federalism, you have to look to either Congress or you have to look to the courts. Um, but Congress, it turns out, can't or won't do all that much. I could give you examples, and that may be a sort of useful exercise for Q&A. <clears throat> the courts cannot do that much either. Either I'm speaking uh, as somebody who has to teach this junk day in, day out. Um, so we're operating, I mean, at the outer margins um, of lawful and constitutional government, and um, undoubtedly, I mean, the boundaries are shifting. So the rock bottom proposition of American administrative law is that every administrative act must have a lawful basis. That is now giving way uh, to the notion that administrative agencies may do whatever is not directly and specifically prohibited by their organic statutes. Right? Because without that, you cannot make these programs work anymore. Um, that is the administration's actual position in King versus Burwell, which is the pending case over the um, uh, Affordable Care Act and the exchange provisions. It says established by a state means established by the federal government in a state. Why? Because without that, the entire Affordable Care Act disintegrates. <clears throat> there are less incendiary examples, uh, but they're almost equally big. Um, the Clean Air Act is an example. Um, so there, in order to make the Clean Air Act, which is designed for things like sulfur and you know really nasty stuff, to make that work for carbon dioxide, the administration had to say, or EPA had to say, well, the statutory numbers there, which say 250 tons per year emissions, actually what that means for carbon dioxide is 100,000 tons. So 250 means 100,000. Um, until we say otherwise. <clears throat> that position remarkably got four votes uh, in the Supreme Court uh, in 2014. Uh, the majority in that case <clears throat> harangued the EPA for its shocking and lawless behaviors. Those are the court's words. But then it allowed the EPA to motor along with its program. Um, right, and the next shoe in that uh, theater has already dropped um, uh, I'll leave that out, uh, but I'd be happy to talk about uh, the EPA's clean power plan, um, which is an even more extreme version or extre extreme example of um, a program that is undertaken without much uh, legal authority and simply through a strat strategy of peeling off or cor corralling states under the federal government's programs one at a time. Where does that end? Mm. There's actually a substantial um, literature which you can read up on, on executive federalism in other countries. 
what all these gov uh, countries have in common is a powerful executive, <clears throat> a weak and fractured legislature, serious cleavages among member states, and very high levels of federal to state transfer payments. What they also have in common is extremely high levels of corruption and of fiscal and political instability. Uh, the leading examples, and you won't like this one bit, um, are Nigeria and Argentina and Brazil. Um, what usually happens in these systems down the road is that federal transfer payments and exemptions, waivers as we call them, cease to correspond to any discernible public purpose, let alone the statutes. Um, what they correspond to is the objective of stabilizing the president's, the executive's pol political power base. So if a state wants to get a fair bargain, it had better go along with the president's uh, wishes and preferences. Um, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, uh, that hasn't happened here yet. Right? If anything, uh, the reverse is true. Right? So to persuade Republican states to participate in uh, federal schemes, the administration has to give them a lot more money and cut them a lot more slack than it would with Democratic states, right? because the red states have a much higher reservation price. Um, so it, there's a great deal, for the time being, a uh, great deal of mileage. Um, for a state in being obstinate and ornery. Um, still, I don't think the sort of Argentina scenario is totally out of the question, uh, and I'm quite confident we haven't seen the end of uh, attempts to hold sort of federalism arrangements together um, by executive edict and bargain. In the end, I think um, one of these things will have to give. Either we dispense altogether with legal and constitutional niceties, that would not be good because I have to keep my family in shoes. Um, or else we rethink and um, reform our federalism arrangements. And in the end, I think there's actually some hope that law will triumph over executive aggrandizement. Um, the reason, I think, is not some sentimental attachment on the part of the American people um, to the rule of law or to the Constitution. I think the reason is the country's ideological division. So one camp or the other will try to mobilize rule of law precepts against the other camp's political ambitions. Uh, for now, resistance to executive aggrandizement um, is, is the stuff of right-wing agitation. But look, if the present administration's theories of administrative law are even remotely true. Um, Bush 45 would not have to repeal Obamacare. Could just waive the entire statute and put its own thing in place without the Congress in negotiation with favored states. <clears throat> and in that environment, I think the current political fronts would change very, very quickly. So regardless of the political constellation in Washington and the states, I think uh, over the coming years, uh, there'll be a lot of constitutional agitation and litigation over these issues. Uh, maybe in all that commotion, we'll find our way back to uh, somewhat more lawful constitutional federalism arrangements. Maybe we won't, but I think you should watch this space because a great deal hangs on what happens. Thank you. We still don't have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for Dante or myself to come to you with a microphone. And as always, preference will go to students. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, what do you think it would look like uh, for the United States to return to dual federalism, and would that be a desirable outcome? Ah. Um, y 
Yeah, <laughs> it would be a very desirable outcome. I mean, as you know that part of the answer, right? Um, I don't know what it would look like. Um, let me put it this way, to the extent that, I mean, I've described this sort of switch from um, federal powers, national in operation, to national powers, federal in operation, right? Um, I've just about given up on sort of relimiting the federal gov government's powers. I think the fights there from Lopez to Morrison to NFIB versus Sibelius, I think that stuff is at the very outer margins. I don't mean to belittle it, and I think it's important uh, for lots of reasons that I'd be happy to explain, but I don't think there'll be much action at that front. Um, I think all of the action is now um, in, in the field of the federal operation of national powers, right? So, and, and that was my topic tonight, the, these arrangements, cooperative arrangements, as they're called, between um, the federal government and the states. I would try, uh, and, and what sort of real federalism would mean in that arena is one problem, one sovereign, right? So make these programs wholly national or make them wholly federal, meaning let the states and local governments do them, but not these, in, I mean, the, these, these interlocking arrangements. So to just give you an example of what that would look like, um, <clears throat> you could make Medicaid wholly national, right? And yank that money off the state's budgets. I think that's the only way to um, save them from fiscal ruin anyhow. So we'll have to do it sooner or later. I might as well do it you know, while there's still time to do it in a roughly coherent way. Lots of my libertarian friends say, well, that's not a libertarian program. That's not even a conservative program. I don't care. I, right? I, you have to somehow arrange the government so that it, um, so that it works. Um, and once you have a single government responsible for the program, maybe we can run it in a fairly responsible fashion. You can cash it out or run it like the VA, I don't really care, right? But make it one government or the other. And there are lots and lots of examples like that. And I think we're running out of time to consider them. Thank you for your talk. And I was actually going to ask um, how you perceive um, programs like the EPA regulating um, issues between states, and it seems like you just answered that by making them wholly state or wholly government programs. Um, my question is, how do you think um, the founders, such as Madison or Hamilton, would respond to the critiques that the Anti-Federalists made at the time of the ratification of the Constitution, claiming that there is no representation at those local levels, so how can a government program that is wholly national adequately respond to the needs of the people at the very local level? <coughs> Excuse me. The first line of response, I mean, and the first response is, I think, Hamilton's, which is, and if, if you look through the argument uh, that, that he gives you why the state implementation of federal programs is really, really bad news, okay? So he gives you two reasons. Um, I mean, I'm distilling them now and translating them into modern parlance. Um, one is there will be agency problems out the wazoo. That is to say, once you commandeer states around, right, and try to make them do stuff, they can always shirk and say, you know, that was just too complicated, so it's the federal government's fault, right? And the feds can always say when stuff fails, well, that was their fault. I mean, they're these faithless agents, right? Um, so that's the first reason. Uh, it's just an unbelievably expensive way of, of running things and um, irresponsibility is built into the system. And the second reason he gives you is that the monitoring costs for private citizens of these joint agreements, of these cooperative arrangements, are huge. You can never tell whose fault that was. And they all have a strategic incentive to lie to you, right? And the way the separation of powers is 
designed is to give our agents incentives to rat on each other, right? To disclose information that would not otherwise come to light. Because we can't control them anyhow, but we can make our agents, con make, make our agents control each other. That's the way the system is supposed to operate. And what these cooperative federalism arrangements look like is they operate on the, on the opposite principle. We let the agents collude and then collectively lie to us, right? And they all have the same interest. Please give us more money, because if you do, it'll work, right? So that's the absolute worst system that you can conceivably have, right? <clears throat> now, uh, I get the point that if these, these programs get too far away from you, okay, um, they might no longer reflect local needs and local demands. Okay, fine, I get that. Um, so if you have systems where local demands and local peculiarities um, are really, really important, like land use, right? Get the feds out of this, right? Make those local if you have to. Um, conversely, I don't see, I mean, look, Social Security is a only national program, and I think that's the right way to go right? Because the feds have huge comparative advantages, right? They can tax on a national basis and they know how to move gobs of money and they're just cutting checks. And there's nothing local about the program that would force you to, or that would make you want to say, keep social security local. I don't know what that is, right? And I think Medicaid is probably a little more like that. Uh, the reason why I sort of was so dismissive of, so of the constitutional considerations, is that I see no hope um, of, of drawing firm lines between, look, if, if we only think harder, we will figure out and all agree on what's national and what's local, right? So I think the first cut is to say, let it be one or the other, right? And then fight later on down the road over, you know, how to, how exactly to organize Medicaid or, does that make sense? Um, so you mentioned that the federal government sometimes have to, you know, give some slack to states or give some money and you also meant uh, to cooperate and you also mentioned that um, the federal government has a power um, to basically encourage states to pass certain legislations based on military necessary laws. Um, and I remember um, learning that the federal government once used uh, the highway funds as a, as a leverage to basically move the age of drinking to 21. So I'm wondering um, to what extent you think the federal government should have the power to leverage such, um, such acts um, to pass legislations that are not necessarily military or taxation? Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, put the military thing aside, that's actually quite complicated. Um, but the leverage point is huge, right? Um, here's what I think about it. Um, once you reach the levels that we have now reached, uh, where well over half the states depend for well over 30% of their budgets on federal transfer, and some states collect more than 40% of their funds from the federal government, the leverage problem is huge, right? Um, and it's a real danger. Um, and it's worth thinking about, and people are getting alarmed about it, right? So James Buckley, former senator, former judge James Buckley, um, has just written a book. It's sort of a little book. I, I think you, are, I mean, it's got to be around here someplace. Professor Kessler has a copy, so ask him. Um, it's called Saving Congress from Itself. And he says, look, this is so hopeless, we have to end any and all federal transfer programs, phase them out, and end them, right? So that's how, drum and, and he's not a crazy, trust me. Um, it, it, that's how serious it is. Now, if the question is, can I think of a constitutional principle to limit these things? 
in particularly a constitutional principle that is enforceable by courts in a fairly reliable way of disciplining this process. There are some things I can think of. Um, so, you know, for example, I mean, there is a rule, it's called a clear statement rule, <clears throat> to the effect that if Congress means to impose conditions on states under these programs, it has to say so clearly. Uh, I believe that's the right rule. I believe that it's done a fair bit to discipline Congress, but at the end of the day, Congress can speak with clarity if it wants to. And so there is no precept or principle to my mind that forbids Washington and the states from bargaining around the original constitutional um, arrangements. So the, the solutions there have to be really budgetary, right, um, or, and, and political and fiscal. <clears throat> I'll add something to that, which is this. Um, I think this will be more dramatic in years to come. Um, we all sit around as if, and the political debate proceeds as if 2008, 2009 never happened and it can never happen again because the Federal Reserve and our fine federal regulators have stabilized the system that will never ever again be a fiscal crisis. Oh really? I think 2008, 2009 was just a warm up act. I think what is going to happen next time, and this is, I don't mean, you know, in your lifetimes, trust me, unfortunately I'll be dead. No, I mean, Within the next decade, there'll be a fiscal crisis, financial crisis, that'll make your teeth rattle, right? And it won't be just banks, it'll be states that will go insolvent. Now, I once, you know, put this question on a con law exam, on constitutional law exam. Uh, imagine a bailout fund for states. Would that be constitutional? Ooh, I never heard the end of it. This did not end well, you know. Let's just say, I don't know the answer, right? And I don't think anybody out there knows the answer. There are huge constitutional problems, right? Do you really think we could have, I mean, the way this was done the last time around is Congress said, here's $700 billion. Go, Mr. Bernanke, <laughs> go, Treasury Department, bail out banks, any banks. Um, right? And those guys sit there and they say, oh, um, actually, we want to do some bailouts, but they're not banks, they're car companies. Would that be okay? Well, the statute says no, but they, we say yes, so here we go. Right? That was called TARP. Suppose we had a TARP for states. So the, the Treasury Department is sitting around there and saying, Illinois, hey, bailout. Right? It's like, I don't know whether you've ever seen the the South Park episode, the bailout one, <laughs> go look at it, <laughs> go Google it. South Park, they have this chicken, right? I mean, in order to do their bailouts, they have a chicken and they lop the head off. And they have the, have the chicken run around on this board where it says bailout, no bailout. Um, <clears throat> that's how they actually made those decisions. Would that be constitutional for states? Ay, ay, ay. Right, and then you have to ask yourself, you can make arrangements, and I mean, this is a real question. You can make arrangements with private banks or AIG or General Motors to pay back to, you can tell them, you will restructure yourself. You will call in new management, right? So your current directors, you, they're out. New management, in. You have a new CEO, congratulations. And you will repay these funds over the next five years in the following fashion. Could you do that to the state? Thank you very much. Your government is obviously incapable of governing its, I mean, its state. Out. Our people in. And then we'll have some arrangements to pay. I don't begin to see how that is consistent with the Constitution. But you may, and you may have to do it, and mind you, that is the way these things are done in, in Argentina and Nigeria. We'll confront the question one way or the other Right? And, and so, and, and in those circumstances to then say, no, wait a minute, 
The Supreme Court will stand in the way and say, and you know, insist on the meticulous observance of the Constitution. No, it won't. That's why I'm saying we have to, I mean, rethink these things in a sort of political fashion. I understand the impulse of saying, let there be some rules and let the Supreme, let the courts enforce them. Ain't the way the world works. Yes, sir. Oh, I'm, oh. Go, sorry, please. we have a microphone yes. system. I'm sorry, Sean. Um. One, two. <laughs> um. And then I'll cold call. Just Thank kidding. You. Thank you so much for your talk. It's nice to have such a lighthearted person teach us a fairly terrifying lesson. Um, a, couple of, <laughs> a couple of questions ago, you, you answered in a fashion of, spoke about running out of time and this sort of like, what happens when we get to the end of this process. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you could clarify a little bit more about like, what do you mean by running out of, like what happens when we reach the end of this? <coughs> like what, what signifies that we have run out of time or that we have, you know, falling apart. In oh, um, that's a terrific question, and I just don't know what the answer is. Um, so, I mean, I've just described one horror scenario, right? Which is bankruptcy, fiscal crisis, um, and that is a scenario that is sort of some really severe outside shock to the system where, oops, all of a sudden people sit up and say, now it's really serious. Um, and what would happen in that scenario, I, don't, I can't really tell. All bets are off, right? It depends on how things shake out and which way exactly this unfolds. Um, and the other, uh, I mean, the other scenario is sort of entropy, right? That is things go on for a very long time and we take one small step and then another small step and then yet another small step and nobody thinks we're going over the cliff and people are just sort of despairing. And, oh, gosh, golly, right? So the alternative to the TARP for states, right, is I don't think they would do that, right? What would ha actually happen is um, that the Bank of America, the CEO of the Bank of America would get a call from Janet Yellen or somebody like her and say, um, you know, Mr. Monan, it's a mighty fine bank you have there. We would hate to see anything bad happen to it. And we think it would be a splendid idea to lend some money to Illinois, don't you think? Right? This is called fiscal repression. That's how they always do it. It wouldn't be the first time. That's how we bailed out Mexico in, in the early 1990s. Uh, that's how a lot of the deals last time around were done. That's how it would be done the next time around or could be done the next time around, right? <clears throat> we could do what, um, uh, uh, what, what uh, Argentina has in fact done, which is inflate the living daylights out of the economy and try it that way. Uh, one way or the other, I think the fiscal aspects of this will dominate. Right, because you just look at the trends and you said, she was, I mean, this cannot go on, this cannot last, this, I don't know. Um, so I, I would look um, at, at the, what happens in the fiscal dimensions uh, is hugely, hugely important. Uh, and I think um, in sort of non-fiscal terms and political terms, um, it'll actually be interesting to see how in how the institutions deal with the sort of disintegration of the Affordable Care Act. I mean, that's a real game changer, right? Um, there's a federal statute, and all of a sudden, you know, more than half the states say no thank you. Golly, I mean, how does the system respond to that? Um, and can it bring itself to, to sort of step back and say, no, wait a minute, that didn't work, and so now we have to figure out some other way to make it work and hopefully some more sensible and better way to make it work. I just don't know. But it's kind of those kinds of things that, that I would watch out for. Uh, thank you very much for coming and speaking with us uh, this evening. Earlier in your talk, you uh, had seemed to be reluctant um, about agencies, administrative agencies that sort of work within their own powers to sort of fulfill a mandate and Congress playing a bit more of a role in prohibiting particular actions than guiding them. Um, and I'm curious uh, sort of to 
push you a little bit on the opportunity cost and sort of the flip side of this federalist view that you present. Um, in particular, given either sort of the apparent failure of either mass mobilization of these parties, sort of patronage politics of these allocations, um, as well as I think generally the fact that um, sort of often cited as a key component of American political decay is our relative um, inautonomous uh, sort of federal agencies. I'm curious uh, what you see as the real alternative to sort of the rise of the bureaucratic state. Um, that is a great, great question. Uh, and I've sort of tried to struggle with it. I mean, the, my latest sort of burbling about this is, it's a long law review article written with a friend of mine, Ashley Parrish. It's called Administrative Law Without Congress, right? And it goes, among other things, to the, the considerations uh, you just mentioned. So, um, right, I've been very vocal about the downside of, sort of improvisation and updating statutes. There's also a downside to, well, if, I mean, if not that, then what? I mean, are we just frozen in place, right? Um, I'd say this. Um, The reason why I'm a little, there are two reasons. Uh, I mean, putting aside sort of abstract considerations of no, the law is the law, you know, that, that I mean, you've already found out that's not me. Um, the reason why I'm a little nervous about giving in too easily to sort of saying, look, Congress can't do this, the courts don't want to do it, and they shouldn't be doing it, and so the agencies are the only game in town. Um, uh, are two. Uh, one of them is that um, regardless of what exactly you think about the sources of Congress's immobility or incapacity is you want to you don't want to make it worse by giving them no incentive to legislate whatsoever, right? So the the cleanest example is <clears throat> is the climate change example. So just to rehearse this, um, the Supreme Court decided the first case on climate change in 2007, that's Massachusetts versus EPA. And what they said there is that, what the court said, is that um, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are pollutants under the Clean Air Act, and therefore the inference is that Congress, uh, that EPA must now regulate them, okay? This would have completely crazy consequences, and even the plaintiffs in that case didn't want that. What the case was actually about was an attempt to mobilize, to spur congressional action, right? Because, okay, fine. I mean, we, sat, we all sat around and, and did nothing about climate change. Now, I mean, the, we face this prospect of climate change regulation under the Clean Air Act. No, that does it. Now Congress has to do something. And Congress just sits there and does nothing, right? And the administration plays this, frankly, to my mind, cynical game of cranking sort of unacceptable proposals into Congress because they now know that the default outcome is EPA regulation, right? So you've diminished the capacity of the political system to do anything at all, I mean, of Congress. <clears throat> That's one reason. And the other reason is that, um, Look, I don't deny that there are urgent problems and you want something done about them, and I'd put the debt first, right? So I get that. But on the other hand, there is this tendency um, in sort of our political debate, and, and it's, it's also in the law review literature on this, to say something must always be done, right? And um, I want to leave room for the co possibility, the constitutional possibility, I would add, is that in a system of separated powers, right, and checks and balances, something, sometimes, nothing will happen, right? And when nothing happens, well, sometimes things don't get worse, right? So it's like, uh, no, please don't reform this. It's bad enough as it is. So. You know, okay, I, I want to resist this sort of impulse of saying there must always be more, 
more intervention, more activity. The executive branch is the branch that never goes to sleep. It's there 24 seven and it must be, I mean the wheel, wheels must keep spinning all the time. So I see the force of your question and, I, and, and it's a very serious objection and, and I don't mean to belittle it, but there are intuitions that make me a little resistant to it. Um, I'm curious to hear your opinion on the extent to which, at least in the popular discussion of this question, it has become almost no longer a constitutional question to many people when they talk about whether the state should be doing something or the federal government should be doing something. What they're really talking about is like the sort of divide between the two parties, essentially. And so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the implications that that has for our ability to remedy any of these problems when the discussion becomes so much polarized that it's no longer really about the Constitution or about what's most effective, but rather about this, this party divide. Right. Uh, I have some very counterintuitive um, notions about this. Uh, I believe that the ideological, um, let's, let's call it sectionalism, right? The fact that our partisan and ideological divisions now coincides to such a great extent with state lines, I believe that's an opportunity and not a danger to the system, right? So long as you deal with sort of states that are homogeneous enough to be bribed into these federal schemes, sorry, that's a tendentious word, but incentivized, right? Or nobody, I mean, nobody will talk about it. Nobody will take anything seriously because ooh, ah, yeah. Um, right, the system fails all the time. See education, see Katrina, see one public policy disaster after another, but people sort of cynically shrug and say, well, whatever, I mean, it doesn't work and you can't do anything about it, right? And it's only when this stuff becomes deeply ideological and people are deeply divided and some states say, no, under no conditions will we cooperate with this that you can actually have a serious discussion about serious issues, right? And so, um, to put this somewhat differently, I, I get it that there are all these, I mean, I can't, I can't tell you how many um, policy books I've read about, oh, nobody is a principled federalist, right? Everybody just wants to sort of tailor federalism norms to their own ideological, um, uh, preferences or, or policy preferences. I think that's the genius of American government, right? Um, look, a federalism principle um, that serves nobody would be dead, right? You spend time, I mean, can you imagine a talk like this I mean, I was born and raised in a federal system, I, ca I can assure you. Um, a talk like this, an event like this, would be inconceivable in Germany. It's a federal system, but it doesn't engage people's interests. It doesn't engage their imagination, right? It's only because sort of federalism and structural constitutional principles become connected with political interests and incentives they have any bite or force at all, right? And so that's the genius of the Constitution to my mind, right? The structural principles just as, just as the First Amendment attract political constituencies. And that's what makes the Constitution live and stay alive in our political discourse. And I think that's a great, great thing. And people do change, I mean, their positions, right? So, I mean, you, you see this in all sorts of settings, right? The ACLU was in favor of religious freedom before they, it was against it. And you know, there are lots of examples like that where people just change their minds about something that you think ought to be a neutral principle like the First Amendment. No, it isn't, right? But that's what sort of makes the country not just, um, well, let me just put it this way. That's not a bad way of running a constitutional democracy. It's a damn good way. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, kind of going off that question, I wonder, so you talk, um, and I see your point about um, you know, 
partisanship bringing attention to these issues at the state level, but I wonder if I could press you on whether or not they would arise as much if there was less partisanship in the you know, federal Congress. Um, and um, you know, so, for example, they could pass a law about you know, carbon regulation that wasn't through statute um, you know, if these problems would arise as much in a less partisan divided atmosphere. I think, I mean, here's, here's what I think bothers me about sort of the, the atmosphere in, in Washington currently is um, uh, the shortening of people's time horizons, okay? Uh, and here's what I mean by that. Uh, so long as people in politics, I mean, legislators and other political actors think, golly, I mean, we won't be running this show forever. And what if we establish now this precedent? What would these other, pardon my French, bastards be capable of doing with this? Right? And that's the nature of politics. I mean, that is what makes you cut deals, right? And some of the biggest enactments in American politics are, I mean, rest on that principle. The, the Administrative Procedure Act, I assure you, is that kind of a bargain, right? Golly, what would happen if the Republicans come into power? Heaven forfend, you know, that should be prohibited, but because it can't be prohibited, we, the Democrats, now cut a deal with them that sort of here's a foundation for the administrative state with some rule of law trappings. There's your compromise, right? And I was a, a, every bit as bitter as anything else, right? It was real, real fight. And there are lots of examples like that. Um, and what's happening now is that people, uh, I mean, behave like there is no tomorrow, right? And as if the other guys can never be in power, right? So there are lots and lots of, you know, articles in the law reviews from people who defend the Affordable Care Act itself, but who are, you know, very, very nervous about the precedent that this creates, and they're being listened to. These are not academic scri scribblers. Nobody listens to them, right? <clears throat> and there are many examples like that. Um, and so, um, that sounds dispiriting. Um, on the other hand, you can, inv I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not in the forecasting business, right, otherwise, I'd be really rich. Um, um, but you can imagine a scenario uh, where the political constellation flips, right? And the other guys, in this case the Republicans, you know, invoke just one really, really bad precedent and let the other side have it. And then both sides coming to the table and say, oops, okay, it's time to call off the dogs and cut a deal. So you can it, so it's it's not so much the the ideological division that bothers me. It's the short time. I mean, short term time horizons that impede people from doing anything sensible at all, even when it's in their interest. That's what worries me. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Please join me once more in thanking Michael Grieva for coming to the app. Thank you all.